Hello, and welcome to the Fighting Moose Podcast. I'm your host and narrator, Jason Hendrickson. This is a podcast where I retell stories, some fictional and some historical, that can be enjoyed by people of all ages. Today, we head to Greece and get into some mythology with the story Orpheus and Eurydice from the book Old Greek Stories Told Anew, written by Josephine Preston Peabody. This actually comes from a request from John. The other day, he asked me, Dad, what are you going to do for the next podcast? I said, I don't know. What should I do? He said, You should do the one about Orpheus or Theseus, the guy who played the harp and defeated the sirens. I remember something about this story, but I had to do a Google search just to confirm. After my search, I confirmed that in fact it was Orpheus. So I found this story, and it brings in some of the Greek characters we have talked about already, i.e. Sisyphus and Tantalus. If you want to hear the story about those guys, just look for the episode titled Sisyphus and Others. So John, thanks for the suggestion. If you have a suggestion for the podcast or want to hear a story, let me know. I am always up for suggestions. Now, let's turn to today's story. I hope you enjoy. Let's begin. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Orpheus in Eurydice. When gods and shepherds piped and the stars sang, that was the day of musicians. But the triumph of Phoebus Apollo himself was not so wonderful as the triumph of a mortal man who lived on earth, though some say that he came of divine lineage. This was Orpheus, the best of harpers who went with the Grecian heroes of the great ship Argo in search of the Golden Fleece. After his return from the quest, he won Eurydice for his wife, and they were as happy as people can be who love each other and everyone else. The very wild beasts loved them, and the trees clustered about their home as if they were watered with music. But even the gods themselves were not always free from sorrow, and one day misfortune came upon that harper Orpheus, whom all men loved to honor. Eurydice, his lovely wife, as she was wandering with the nymphs, unwittingly trod upon a serpent in the grass. Surely, if Orpheus had been with her, playing upon his lyre, no creature could have harmed her. But Orpheus came too late. She died of the sting and was lost to him in the underworld. For days he wandered from his home, singing the story of his loss and his despair to helpless passers-by. His grief moved the very stones in the wilderness and roused a dumb distress in the hearts of savage beasts. Even the gods on Mount Olympus gave ear, but they held no power over the darkness of Hades. Wherever Orpheus wandered with his lyre, no one had the will to forbid him entrance, and at length he found unguarded that very cave that leads to the underworld where Pluto rules the spirits of the dead. He went down without fear, the fire in his living heart found him a way through the gloom of that place. He crossed the Styx, the black river that the gods name as their most sacred oath. Chiron, the harsh old ferryman who takes the shades across, forgot to ask of him the coin that every soul must pay. For Orpheus sang, 
There in the underworld, the song of Apollo would not have moved the poor ghosts so much. It would have amazed them like a star far off that no one understands. But here was a human singer, and he sang of things that grow in every human heart, youth and love and death, the sweetness of the earth, and the bitterness of losing aught that is dear to us. Now the dead, when they go to the underworld, drink of the pool of Lethe, and forgetfulness of all that has passed comes upon them like a sleep, and they lose their longing for the world, they lose their memory of pain, and live content with that cool twilight. But not the pool of Lethe itself could withstand the song of Orpheus, and in the hearts of the shades all the old dreams awoke wondering. They remembered once more the life of men on earth, the glory of the sun and moon, the sweetness of new grass, the warmth of their homes, all the old joy and grief that they had known, and they wept. Even the Furies were moved to pity. Those, too, who were suffering punishment for evil deeds ceased to be tormented for themselves and grieved only for the innocent Orpheus who had lost Eurydice. Sisyphus, that fraudulent king who is doomed to roll a monstrous boulder uphill forever, stopped to listen. The daughters of Danaeus left off their task of drawing water in a sieve. Tantalus forgot hunger and thirst, though before his eyes hung magical fruits that were wont to vanish out of his grasp, and just beyond reached bubbled the water that was a torment to his ears. He did not hear it while Orpheus sang. So, among a crowd of eager ghosts, Orpheus came, singing with all his heart, before the king and queen of Hades. And the queen, Proserpina, wept as she listened and grew homesick, remembering the fields of Enna and the growing of the wheat and her own beautiful mother, Demeter. Then Pluto gave way. They called Eurydice, and she came, like a young guest unused to the darkness of the underworld. She was to return with Orpheus, but on one condition. If he turned to look at her once before they reached the upper air, he must lose her again and go back to the world alone. Wrapped with joy, the happy Orpheus hastened on the way, thinking only of Eurydice, who was following him. Past Lethe, across the sticks they went, he and his lovely wife, still silent as a shade. But the place was full of gloom, the silence weighed upon him. He had not seen her for so long, her footsteps made no sound, and he could hardly believe the miracle, for Pluto seldom relents. When the first gleam of upper daylight broke through the cleft to the dismal world, he forgot all, save that he must know if she still followed. He turned to see her face, and the promise was broken. She smiled at him forgivingly, but it was too late. He stretched out his arms to take her, but she faded from them, as the bright snow that none may keep melts in our very hands. A murmur of farewell came to his ears no more. She was gone. He would have followed, but Chiron, now on guard, drove him back. Seven days he lingered there between the worlds of life and death, but after the broken promise, Hades would not listen to his song. Back to the earth he wandered, though it was sweet to him no longer. He died young, singing to the last, and round about the place where his body rested, nightingales nested in the trees. His lyre was set among the stars, and he himself went down to join Eurydice unforbidden. 
Those two had no need of Lethe, for their life on earth had been wholly fair, and now that they are together, they no longer own a sorrow. We've been uh, talking about Quality Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fighting Moose Podcast. Please join us next time as we read another exciting story. Today's music was provided by the artist Analog by Nature, and the audio clips were provided from NASA. For more information to download and or listen to audio or materials from all our recordings, or to contact us, please visit www.thefightingmoose.com or You can follow the links in the show notes. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave us a review wherever you get your podcast or on iTunes and tell a friend. Thank you for your patronage, and as always, try and do a random act of kindness every day. Mission complete, Houston. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in history. It's come to a final stop.